بان محمد بفرمان شما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد نبيه وآله وسلم تسليما نصار أرواح تيبة شهداء كربلاء وجهة سلامتي خورتان وجهة سلامتي حضرة ولي عصر عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اجماعا صلوات دوم را بلندتر Welcome to the Imam Hussein Foundation YouTube channel which is a global channel which reaches out across the world to mu'mineen and in these nights which are sacred nights, the holy month of Ramadan, is the month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, may Allah accept all your ibadat in this holy month. And for those who are sick, for those who are in difficulty, who are going through difficult economic times, we have a huge amount of poverty around the world. May Allah strengthen our iman to reach out and help those who are in need. There is no greater ibadat than helping the needy. One of the ways that we can help ourselves is to help the needy. One of the ways we can know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by giving charity and by giving to those who are in need. The month of Ramadan is not only for those privileged, but it is also for the poor people. So in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the rich and the poor are fasting. And this is something we should realize is a message from the Almighty that whether you're rich or you're poor in the eyes of the Almighty, you are the same, you are equal in his eyes. And what makes you different is your piety, your taqwa, and your ikhlas in amal. And when you give charity, they say that the left hand should not know what the right hand is doing. Don't shout about it. Allah is the one who gives and he is the one who rewards. And for this reason, the Holy Prophet has been commanded to say, O Prophet, tell the people, I seek no reward for my mission, for my risala, other than the muhibbat towards my family. And as lovers of Ahlul Bayt salam, we have to take this message very seriously. The love of Ahlul Bayt alayhim is the is in the heart of our madhab. If you go from this world, and I said last night, man mata walam ya'rif imam zamanahi ma tamita tal jahiliya. And this is a tradition which is narrated within all schools of thought within the Islamic world. That the Prophet was told to say to the people, I seek no reward for my mission other than love for Ahlul Bayt And we are in waiting, we are in intazar. We should be so grateful that we are in an era where we see troubles, turmoil, political upheaval, poverty, 
earthquake, all kinds of calamity. In those times, the Prophet has says, Ar mu'min kal jabal rasiq. A mu'min must be immovable in his steadfastness, in his iman. And his place is where? In the mosque, in the masjid, in the house of God. And this is where we are. And as a reminder to myself that when you enter the mosque, especially in the month of Ramadan, your mizban, your host, is the Almighty. So whatever you seek in your heart, make your khalwat with the Almighty. Seek from him what you want. Inshallah, by haqqa Hazrat Fatima Zahra, salamu alayha, the Almighty, in these nights especially, will reward you with your hajat, inshallah. So very, be very careful that these nights are very holy nights. Do not distract yourself. Remain steadfast in your du'as. The greatest jihad is the jihad of the nafs. And we as mu'mineen should know that the greatest jihad is that of fighting with your nafs. The greatest jihad is the jihad that you have inside fighting against your nafs. Don't let your nafs distract you. In these nights, we pray for the coming May Allah hasten the reappearance of our awaited Imam and may he grant shafa to all the sick, the ill, those who are in hospitals and may he also give us more love and may the nur and walaya of the love for Imam Ali salam and his family and the family of the Prophet, may peace be upon them, grow stronger and stronger as each day passes, as each day passes, we are getting closer to the rise of our beloved Imam, Ajalallah Ta'ala Farajuh Sharif. With that, now, with that said, I would now like to ask our most esteemed guest, Hajjara Dr. Ismail Misbahi, to recite Dua'i Iftata with a loud salawat. اللهم إني أفتته الثناء بحمدك وأنت مسدد للشباب بمنك بيغنت أنك أنت رحم الرحيم في موضع العفو والرحمة وأشد المعقبين في موت النكال والنغمة وعظم المتجبرين في موت الكبرياء والعظمة اللهم أدنت لي في دعائك ومسألتك فاسمع يا سميع متحتي واجب يا رحيم دعوتي وأغل يا غفور أثرتي فكم يا إلهي من كربة قد فرجت وهموم قد كشفت وأثرة قد أغلت ورحمة قد نشرت وحلقة بلاء قد فككته الحمد لله الذي 
لم يتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الموت ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا الحمد لله بجميع محامده كلها على جميع نعمه كلها الحمد لله الذي لا مضاد له في ملكه ولا منازع له في أمره الحمد لله الذي لا شريك له في خلقه ولا شبيه له في عظمته الحمد لله الفاشي في الخلق أمره وحمده الظاهر بالكرم مجده الباسط بالجود يده الذي لا تنغش خزائنه ولا تزيد كثرة العطاء إلا جودا وكرما إنه هو العزيز الوحاب اللهم إني أسألك غليلا من كثير ما حاجة بي إليه عظيما وغناك عنه غديم وهو عندي كثير وهو عليك سهل يسير اللهم إن عفوك عن ذنبي وتجاوزك عن خطيئتي وشرحك عن ظلمي وسترك على غبيه عملي وحلمك عن كثير جرمي عندما كان من خطئي وعمدي أطماني في أن أسألك ما لا أستوجبه منك الذي رزقتني من رحمتك وأريتني من قدرتك وعرفتني من إجابتك فصرت أدعوك آمنا وأسألك مستانسا لا خائفا ولا وجلا مدلا عليك فيما غشت فيه إليك فإن أبطى عني عتبت بجهلي عليك ولعل الذي أبطى عني هو خير لي لإلك بعاقبة الأمور فلم أرى مولا كريما أشبر على عبد ليم منك علي يا رب إنك تدعوني فأبلي عنك وتتهبب إلي فأتبقض إليك وتتودد إلي فلا أقبل منك كان لي التطبل عليك فلم يمنعك ذلك من الرحمة لي والإحسان إلي والتفضل علي بجودك وكرمك فرهام عبدك الجاه فرهام فرهام عبدك الجاه مجود عليه بفضل احسانك انك جواد كريم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجر الفلك مسخر الرياح فالغ الاشباح ديان الدين رب العالمين الحمد لله على حلمه بعد علمه والحمد لله على عفوه بعد قدرته 
والحمد لله على طول اناته في غضبه وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الرزق فالق الاشباء ذي الجلال والاكرام والفضل والانعام الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشاهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي ليس له منازع يادل ولا شبيه يشاكل ولا ظهير يعدد غهر بعزته العزة وتبادع لعظمته العظماء فبلغ بقدرته ما يشاء الحمد لله الذي يجيبني حين انادي ويستر علي كل عورة وانا عصي ويعظم النعمة علي فلا اجازي فكم من موهبة هنيئة قد اعطاني وعظيمة مخوفة قد كفاني وبهجة مونغة قد أراني فأثني عليه حامدا وأذكره مسبحا الحمد لله الذي لا يهتك حجاب ولا يغلق باب ولا يرد سائل ولا يخيب آمل الحمد لله الذي يؤمن الخائفين وينجى الصالحين ويرفع المستضعفين ويدع المستكبرين ويهلك ملوكا ويستخلف آخرين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين الحمد لله الذي من خشيته ترهد السماء وسكانه وترجف الارض وعمارها وتموج البهار ومن يسبه في غمراته الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي يخلق ولم يخلق ويرزق ولا يرزق ويطعم ولا يطعم ويميت الأحياء ويحيي الموتى وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وأمينك وصفيك وحبيبك وخيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك 
و مبلغ رسالاتک افضل و احسن و اجمل و اکمل و از کاون ما و اطیب و اطهر و اصنا و اکتر ما شلیت و بارکت و ترحمت و تحننت و سلمت علا احد من عبادک و انبیائک و رسولک و شفتک و اهل الكرامت علیک من خلقك اللهم وصل على علي أمير المؤمنين ووصي رسول رب العالمين عبدك ووليك وأخي رسولك وحجتك على خلقك وآيتك الكبرى والنبأ العظيم وصلى على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وصلى على سبطة الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة وصلى على أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهود المهدي حجج کلا عبادک و امنای کفی بلادک شلاتن کثیرتن دائم اللهم و صل على ولی امرك القائم المعبد و العدل المنتدى و حفه به ملائکتك المقربین وَيَدُ وَيَدُ بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ يَا رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ اللهم جلح الدعي إلى كتابك والقائم بدينك استخلفه في الأرض كما استخلفت الذين من قبله مكن له دينه الذي ارتديته له عبدله من بعد خوفه أمنا يعبدك لا يشرك بك شيئا اللهم أعزه وأعزز به وانصره وانتصر به وانصره نصرا عزيزا وافتح له فتحا يسيرا وجعل له من لدنك سلطانا نصيرا اللهم اظهر به دينك وسنة نبيك حتى لا يستخفي بشيء من الحق مخافة أحد من الخير اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعزو بها الإسلام وأهلا وتدل بها النفاق وأهلا وتجعلنا فيها من الدعوات إلى طاعتك والغادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما عرفتنا من الحق فعملنا وما غشرنا عنه وفلقنا اللهم المون به شعثنا وشعب به صدعنا وارتق به فتخنا وكثر به قلتنا وعزز به دلتنا وعقن به آئلا 
زنا وقوه بهی ام مقرم نا وجبر بهی فقر نا و صده بهی خلت نا و یسر بهی عصر نا و بیر بهی وجوه نا و فکر بهی عصر نا و انجه بهی قلبت نا و انجز بهی موائی دنا و استجب بهی دعوت نا و اعطنا بهی سؤلنا و بلغنا بهی من الدنیا و الاخرت آمالنا و اعطنا بهی فوق رغبتنا یا خیر المسئولی یا خیر یا خیر و اوس المقین اشف بهی صدورنا و اذهب بهی غیب قلوبنا و اهدنا بهی لمختل ففیه من الحق به ابنک انک تهدی من تشاء الى صراط مستقیم و انصرنا بهی علا عدوک و عدونا الى الحق آمی اللهم انا نشبو الیک فغد نبینا صلواتك عليه وآله وغيبة ولينا وكثرة دبنا وغلة عددنا وشدة الفتن بنا و تظاهر الزمان علينا و صلى على محمد و آله و انا على ذلك بفتح منك تعجلو و بذر تكشفو و نصر تعزو و سلطان حق تظهرو و رحمت من کت و جلل ناها و آفیت من کت و لبس ناها به رحمت که یا ارحم الراحمی سلام برای شادی روح گذشتگان خودتون گذشتگان این جمع مرحوم آجاقای نوروزداده و مرحوم پدر و مادر من قراحت بفرمه سوره فاتحه همراه با سلام Many thanks to our most esteemed guest, Dr. Ismail Misbahi, for that eloquent recitation of Dua'i Iftata. And now we would like to welcome another esteemed guest, Sayyid Amar Naqabi, who is a very learned scholar, and inshallah will give, has, give us the pleasure of his lecture with a loud salawat.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق الأجمعين بائث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا حبيبنا حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد فقد قال الله في كتابه مبين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي Brothers and sisters may we begin with the salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad The ayah that I began the khutbah with, brothers and sisters, I would quite potentially put up as one of the most mistranslated and misunderstood ayahs of the Holy Qur'an. When we state la ikhraha fid deen, this is sometimes used in the incorrect context. When I say that there's no, uh, we can say, compulsion in religion, this is oftentimes used as a tool for people who want to do something in the name of Islam when it has nothing to do with the religion whatsoever. We don't need to do this, there is no compulsion in religion. We don't need to do that, there is no compulsion in religion. We don't need to pray, there's no compulsion in religion. We don't need to wear the hijab, la ikraha fid deen. So we need to now answer the question, if this is an ayah of the Qur'an, which it is, how are we supposed to interpret it? Because it's a question, is it not? The Qur'an itself is saying la ikraha fid deen. The Qur'an itself is saying that there is no compulsion in religion. And then on the other hand, we're saying that you have to pray salah, you have to fast, you have to wear hijab, you have to do these things. So how do these two points liaise? How do these two points make sense? And inshallah, by the end of our discussion, we'll come to understand what the actual meaning and the tafsir of this ayah of the Qur'an is and how it links up with our worldview of being someone looking at the world through a tawhidi world lens. Now... First, I think we should interpret what the definition of deen is. La iqraha fi deen. Yes? So first and foremost, what does deen mean? We sometimes have a very limited perspective and angle of what deen actually means. However, if we come to understand the actual definition of deen, the matter will become a lot clearer. Masala, in the Quran, I ask you, brothers and sisters, has deen ever been brought in the plural form? Ever. The word deen, has it ever been brought in the plural form? Absolutely not. So what does that tell us? That tells us that when we're looking at the word deen, and when we're looking at, we can say religion in this context, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extremely clear that the deen that's being referred to here is the monotheistic creed that started from Hazrat Adam and ended with Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala So that's, we can say, the opening definition of deen Yes, there is some allusion to an other deen. For example, lakum dinukum waliyadeen. Yes, now there's an inference of another deen taking place here. However, the point I would like to bring forward here is that there is one deen of the haq and one deen of the na haq. So then again, our context is still valid. Our argument is still valid. Is it not? That when we state that the deen is one, when we state that the religion is one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that. Now, if we understand that the deen is one, if we understand that the religion is one, and if we understand that the essence of tawheed is the deen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about here, then we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just linking it to another ayah of the Quran. When we look at Surah Rum ayah 30, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Fitrat Allah illati fatara nasa alayha, He says the fitrat of Allah is with inside each person. Allah is telling you that your deen is with inside the very same fitrah. Your deen is with inside the very same essence. So when I state that the deen is one, when I state that the deen is singular, when I state that our fitrah is to follow that deen, I'm talking about tawheed here. I'm talking about the worshipping of one God. I'm talking about the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the first of our usul al-deen. 
So understanding Tawheed here, we can now move forward with our discussion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he states that leaving the religion, we can say, or doing something in accordance with apostasy is something that is punishable with very severe punishments. Why is this the case? Because it's against our own fitrah. It's against our own essence. It's against our own understanding. So when we see that our own fitrah is telling us to understand the Tawheedi worldview, if by comparison we don't follow this fitrah, if by comparison we don't follow this deen, then we can't truly understand and say that there is compulsion. However, it's a good point in theory, is it not? In theory, it's not a bad discussion. However, brothers and sisters, I ask you, how do apostasy laws tie in here? What's the punishment for apostasy in the religion, brothers and sisters, I ask you? Death, is it not? And this is something Muslims are constantly scrutinized and criticized on. That the punishment for apostasy is death. So how are you on one hand saying that there's no compulsion in religion? And on one hand you're saying, for example, we're talking about a Tawhidi worldview. The same monotheistic creed that's been brought from Hazrat Adam, that's in regards to your fitrah. As long as you don't abandon your own fitrah, you are going to be fine. How does that link with apostasy laws? How does that link with the death penalty in an Islamic state for one who walks away from the religion, from one who walks away from the deen? By the end of our discussion, brothers and sisters, inshallah, we will come to understand how we can actually justify, how we can rationalize, how we can possibly logically state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by stating la iqraha fid deen, this is in direct, not contradiction. We can say complementary to the fact that we have the apostasy laws that we have. Now, I stated, belief is not from compulsion, correct? And this is something that we all know. Belief is not from compulsion. If I force someone to become a Muslim, are they going to become a Muslim? Are they going to believe in Allah? No. They're going to act as if they do, right? If I force someone to do salah, is that salah accepted? No, it was by force. If I force someone, for example, to fast, is that fast accepted? No, it's by force. So this aspect of la iqraha fid deen holds true, yes? There is no compulsion in religion, in regards to actually forcing the person to do the habits because there is a very clear difference, brothers and sisters, between heartfelt conviction and just rationally doing something. If I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I believe in fasting and I believe in praying and I believe in all of these things, only then can I claim to be a true Muslim, correct? Only then can I claim to have taslim. However, if I'm doing things without actually rationalizing if I'm doing things without actually understanding the essence of them, how can I claim to be a true Muslim? So then the question still remains, La ikraha fid deen, there is no compulsion in religion, yet we're told to fast, yet we're told to pray, yet we're told to observe the hijab, now we're almost having a contradiction. Are we not? On one hand you're saying that you can't have conviction if you don't believe in something. On the other hand you're saying there is no compulsion in religion, but also you're saying that there are death laws for those who are apostates. Now inshallah we will try to bring these three points together. So we only use compulsion when, brothers and sisters, when's the only point we use compulsion? If you're trying to teach someone something, for example your child, when you're trying to teach them something and you are unable to explain that thing to them, what comes next? Compulsion, right? Even though this is good for you, I know it's good for you, I'm unable to explain it at this point because, for example, a plethora of reasons, compulsion comes in here. But I tell you that deen, religion, the aspect that we're speaking about, has got nothing to do with confusion. There's no lack of clarity here, right? So there's no compulsion that comes to play. There's no ijbad that comes to play. Compulsion only comes in when there's a lack of clarity in the matter, correct? There's only ever compulsion when I'm unable to explain something properly. If I'm trying to explain, for example, there's a new trend going around in the health industry these days of the ice bath, right? If you ice bath every morning, this is very good for you. I was thinking about this quite deeply, that there are profound health benefits to ice bath. Yes, profound health benefits, testosterone levels, skin, so on and so forth. But if someone was just told to do an ice bath every morning, if someone was just told to have a cold shower every morning and not told why, they would not understand the reason behind which they're doing it, correct? They would do it and they would receive a degree of benefits. However, that we can say spiritual enlightenment, that uplifting would not be there because they don't know the reasons behind it. 
So say all scientific literature was to be erased tomorrow, and that tradition of ice baths still remains, after five, ten generations, people are going to be doing ice baths without actually understanding why. Our religion has become the same, yes? We, for example, are doing salah, generations have passed, we knew to the root why we were doing it. And we knew 100% that it's good for us, but now we have forgotten the essence behind why we are doing things. We have forgotten the essence behind what things are. And now we are in a state where we are simply doing things for the sake of doing them. However, coming back to our discussion, لا إقراها في الدين. There is no compulsion in religion. Let's come back to the ayah that I read at the beginning of the khutbah. What did I state exactly? I stated, and I'm just going to read the English translation, لا إقراها في الدين. There is no compulsion in religion. And the issue that we have in modern, we can say secular societies, liberal societies, that why people use this as a tool, for example, to say, I don't need to pray. I don't need to wear hijab. I don't need to do these things. They, in very typical fashion, have not read the entire ayah. Now let's read the entire ayah and come to understand what this verse actually means. The ayah continues. There is no compulsion in religion. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a very intricate point. The right way is clearly distinguished from the wrong. So one who rejects the taghut, first action is given to us here. One who rejects the taghut and then believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has indeed held firm to the handle. And one who holds firm to the handle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indeed all hearing and all knowing. Now, what does this mean? So first and foremost, I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first say that we need to have disbelief in the taghut before we have belief in Allah? We need to have disbelief in the taghut first, yes? Why didn't belief in Allah come first? We had this discussion a few days ago, and it's based upon the notion of la ilaha illallah, yes? First, you need to dispel all of the kuf from yourself. First, you need to get rid of all of the false gods. First, you need to get rid of all of the idols, then you can believe in Allah. So when, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Baqarah, this ayah comes up, he's stating, first, you need to denounce all of the taghut. First, you need to denounce all that or all those who are wrong and incorrect. And only then are you in a position to believe in the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Point number one. Point number two. Don't you think the analogy is interesting? The analogy at the end. If you hold firm to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is akin to what? Holding firm to a handle, right? Brothers and sisters, I ask you, one who holds on to a handle or one who holds on to a pot, how is this similar to holding on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If I want to preserve the contents of the pot, if I want to con uh, preserve the contents of the jug, what's now necessary for me to hold on to the handle, correct? So the similarity that's being brought in here is a similarity between eternal bliss and holding on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you can achieve eternal bliss. You can achieve that substance within the pot. However, what do you need to do? You need to hold firm to the handle. What do you need to do? You need to hold firm to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That point has been mentioned. And now we can come to a conclusion in regards to how, why do apostasy laws exist and how can they possibly liaise with the fact that there is no compulsion in religion? So, let's go through this step by step. We have a few minutes left. However, I believe we can come to a conclusion in the matter. So, we did the tafsir of the ayah where you need to hold on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only when you've held on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can you actually have any chance for eternal bliss. Correct? So, again, these are very good theoretical arguments, but at the end of the day, we have apostasy laws. And these apostasy laws are very clear that a person needs to be sentenced to death once they leave the religion. How is this a fair religion, brothers and sisters? How is this a religion of justice? You're talking about Allah, Rahman, Rahim, 114 times in the Quran, but you're killing people as soon as they leave the religion? How is this making sense? And how is this making sense? It is a good question, is it not? Insha'Allah, this is where we will conclude. So first and foremost, let's look at that question. Was Islam spread by the sword? Or was Islam spread by conversion? And this links with La Iqraha Fiddin, yes? The most we can say, the biggest aggressors against the religion of Islam, they state that Islam was spread by the sword. Islam was spread by aggression. It wasn't spread by conversion. So La Iqraha Fiddin, null and void. The Quran doesn't make sense. Let's look at this point. Now, looking at Rasulullah's life, he spent 13 years after the Nubuwa was declared. 13 years in Mecca, 
and then the last 11 years in Medina. So let's first look at the th first 13 years quickly. The first 13 years, when he was in Mecca, were the Muslims a majority or were they mi minority? They were the minority. So you can't coerce anyone when you're the minority. You can't force someone to do anything when you're the minority. So those first 13 years, it's impossible for compulsion to have come into the religion. Now let's look at the last 11 years. What happened here? So when Rasulullah went to Medina, did he conquer Medina by force? Was there, for example, a spilling of blood? Was there, for example, a war that went on here? Or was there a different conversation? Brothers and sisters, which two tribes were in Medina at the time Rasulullah went? I was in Khazraj, correct? I was in Khazraj. Did they convert before or after Rasulullah went? They already accepted the religion. They were happy with it. So there was no compulsion here. Rasulullah entered. When he entered Medina, there was a Jewish tribe, correct? The Jewish tribe didn't want to accept the religion. Was compulsion brought in here? No. What happened here? Rasulullah uh, wrote the charter where he said that no insult will be given to the Jewish community and they will have the same rights as the Muslim. No compulsion here. Let's look at the major battles and see if there was any compulsion in them, one by one. The first battle that we are going to look at is the Battle of Badr. Brothers and sisters, the Battle of Badr, was this an act of compulsion where they're forcing religion down people's throats or was it an act of defense? So Badr was a place that was 80 miles from Medina and 200 miles from Mecca. If a place is 80 miles from Medina and 800 miles from Mecca, is this a battle of defense or is this a battle of attack? It's a battle of defense, yes? They came 200 miles from Mecca, then Rasulullah went out to defend. Point number one. Point number two, when we look at Uhud, what's going on at Uhud? Uhud is the name of a mountain just outside Medina. The same point holds. This was in defense. There was no compulsion. There was no spreading the religion by sword. This was all entirely what? This was all entirely an act of defense. Let's look at the next one. If we look at Ahzab, Khandaq. Khandaq was an entirely defensive bout, was it not? When they dug the trench and then everyone couldn't get into it because of an act of defense. Let's look at the last one of our discussion today. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah and what happens here? When Rasulullah went to conquer Mecca, did he kill them? When Rasulullah went to conquer Mecca, did he slaughter them? Absolutely not. What actually happened in Mecca was what? Rasulullah signed the peace treaty. The peace treaty lasted for 10 years. However, they turned back upon the terms of their peace treaty. And then what went on from here? Rasulullah said, without spilling any blood, that I am now going to conquer this land. So the beauty of the conquest of Mecca was this. That there was no spilling of blood. And not only was there no spilling of blood. What did Rasulullah say? You have four months to learn about the religion of Islam. I'm not going to kick you out. You have four months to learn about the religion. If you accept the religion, you're welcome to stay. If you don't, you're welcome to leave. There was no compulsion. There was no forcing. There was no, you have to be a Muslim. When in the Quran, where we state, for example, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Fadakir, Innama Mudakir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Rasulullah that his role is what? And if we understand this point, we understand the basis of the religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا وَذَكِّرْ You have been sent as a reminder, not as an enforcer. This is a very important point, brothers and sisters. You have been sent as a reminder, not as an enforcer. What do we tend to do? Enforce, enforce, enforce. Down people's throats. You have to be a Muslim. Listen to what I'm saying. Compulsion, compulsion. When in the Quran it stays, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ So understanding this, we can now conclude our discussion on the very same fact. That if we state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with free will, we have the free will to choose what religion we want to go in, yes? And if we look at, for example, what happened in Mubahila, did Rasulullah actually force the people to convert to the religion of Islam? No. He said, let's have a debate on who the actual son of um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a'udhu billah, is. And once the mubahila was over, there was no compulsion. And even if you look at, for example, Muslims living, or rather non-Muslims living in Muslim lands, was there a compulsion for them to convert? No. They were just asked to contribute a jizya. They were asked to contribute a certain amount of money so that they can live in Muslim lands, so that they can live in that place. 
and they were exempt from khums and they were exempt from zakat because they were not Muslims. So our discussion is now coming to a close, is it not? When it comes to compulsion, there's no place for it whatsoever. When it comes to forcing someone to do something, there is no place for it whatsoever. So when we understand that notion, brothers and sisters, we come back to our opening argument. What about apostasy laws? What about apostasy laws? Right? How can you justify all of this beauty? How can you justify Rasulullah in all of his glory, defending everything he did, not forcing anyone to convert, allowing everyone to live freely with apostasy laws in this notion? Our biggest mistake is what, brothers and sisters? We think our life is limited from our birth to our death. All right? But if we understand the actual depth of the religion of Islam, and if we actually remind ourselves, because we know what the purpose of religion is, brothers and sisters, apostasy laws are not deemed to be, we can say, something that's looked down upon. So, there are two types of apostasy laws. One for the murtadeh milli, one for the murtadeh fitri. Yes? So someone who was born a Muslim, if they leave the religion, what does the sharia say? They are to be killed. Yes? If someone was born a Muslim, and they now leave the religion, they are to be killed even if they repent. Yes? Someone who was a murtada milli, so someone who converted to the religion, if they leave the religion, they are exempt, they are not killed as long as they repent. So what's this telling us now? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his rahmah, and if we understand this point, the whole concept of divine justice will be extremely clear here. Extremely. How can we justify an individual being sentenced to death for leaving the religion? Because our ignorance is this. We think death is the final straw. We think death is the worst punishment to man. But I ask you, brothers and sisters, is there not a life that's going to come in afterwards? Is there not a life that's going to happen after death? There was a story about a gentleman. And he said that there was a flood, I believe, in Oxfordshire. There was a flood in Oxfordshire and a boy's leg got caught. Yes? A boy's leg got caught in the flood. So the parents, in trying to get the boy out, they tried so hard to get the leg out. The water was getting higher, the water was getting higher, it was getting higher. And instead of them, for example, getting the boy out, they all drowned in the flood itself. So the person who was narrating the story, he stated that this would have never happened to me. And the person in the interviewer said, how so? He said, as soon as this would have happened to me, I would have said, cut my leg off. Because once you cut the leg off, there's still a chance for survival. Yes? If you cut the leg off, there's still a chance for salvation. How does this link to our story in apostasy? Brothers and sisters, I ask you, we believe in a life after death, do we not? We believe in a life after we pass away, do we not? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his rahmah, he's saying if you were born a Muslim and you have tawheed with inside you and you have now left it, maybe I, your life ending now, there is a higher chance of you attaining salvation than for you to live another 60, 70 years and cause facade for yourself and other people where you have a worse time in the akhirah and they have a worse time in the akhirah as well. Even the apostasy them, laws themselves are out of the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the apostasy laws themselves are an act of salvation for us that maybe we have the opportunity to gain salvation. Maybe we have the opportunity to become better. So understanding this, an individual, for example, say they've been sentenced to death. They left the religion today, they've been sentenced to death. Maybe this individual, from the time they have been sentenced to the time they are executed, they will do more tawbah and ibadat of kafiyat in that period than they would for another hundred years. So tell me, is Allah not Rahman? Is Allah not Rahim? This is the utmost act of Rahman. This is the utmost act of mercy. That if we understand that even this is an act for our own salvation, we can see that the apostasy laws, most definitely, it makes sense with la iqraha fid deen. So our revised definition of la iqraha fid deen is what exactly, brothers and sisters? There is no compulsion in accepting the religion. There's a bracket, yes? There is no compulsion in accepting the religion, as we can see by the arguments, by the anbiya and the ma'asumin. There is no compulsion in accepting it. However, once you've accepted it, then you need to surrender. Once you've accepted it, then you need to do taslim, right? Because once you've accepted it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you in this path where he wants you to be guaranteed for salvation. It's like marriage, no? Say for example, you're meeting someone and you're having conversations. You can leave at any time, right? There's no obligation. However, brothers and sisters, what happens after you read the nikah? What happens after you sign the contract? Can you leave? Taking divorce out of the argument for the second because you don't get married to get divorced. 
can you leave at this point in time? No. Right? You're supposed to work it out. You're supposed to stay there together. So the laws have now changed. When, for example, before the nikah was read, the laws were different. However, now that the nikah has been read, now that the contract has been signed, what's happened here? The laws have changed. Yes? The laws have changed for your own benefit. You're supposed to not leave your spouse for your own benefit so that you all grow together. If you could leave at the first difficulty, what growth would there be? If you could leave the religion at the first difficulty, what growth would there be? So when we say there is no compulsion in religion, there is a bracket here. And one of the brackets that we can state is we can state there is no compulsion in accepting religion. My final sentence is on this. What is the ayah that comes before this? We need to read surahs in context. What's the ayah that comes before this? La iqraha fid deen. It's a very important ayah. We all know it by heart. Ayatul kursi. Before la iqraha fid deen, Ayatul Kursi comes in the Holy Quran. And brothers and sisters, tell me what Ayatul Kursi is about. It's entirely about divine unity, is it not? It's entirely about divine attributes. It's entirely about divine glory. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has introduced himself in Ayatul Kursi, which is one of the most powerful ayahs of the Quran, and says, if you understand divine unity, if you understand divine attributes, if you understand divine mercy, if you understand Ayatul Kursi, there is no need for compulsion in religion. There is no need for forcing anyone to do anything. Because if you understand Tawheed, La iqraha fid deen, there is no compulsion in religion because the matter has become extremely clear. Brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq to understand clarity and knowledge for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq not to act in compulsion but rather to act in free will. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq to succeed in jihad al-akbar. وآخر دعوانا والحمد لله رب العالمين صلوات على محمد وآل الطاهرين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارء الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم ولعنة الله على أعدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين قال حسين بن علي عليهم الصلاة والسلام ابدأ بمن تعول أمك أباك أختك وأخاك ثم أدناك فأدناك بار دیگر خدا را شاکرين که روز بست ششم ماه مبارک رمضان را به خوبی سپری کردیم 
و توانستیم دور هم جمع شویم پیرامون رسائل ماه مبارک رمضان و جلساتی که پیرامون ماه مبارک رمضان در این بنیاد شریف بود الحمدلله جمع شویم و فضائل اهل بیت علیهم صلوات الله بشنویم خدای باری تعالی به حق بی بی دعالم تمامی مریض ها را از سا شفای آجل انایت بفرماید مریض های معلوم مریضه معلوم اونهایی که از من و شما التماس دعا کردن اونا را خدا هم شفای آجل انایت بفرماید به ویجه دوست عزیز ما حاج گل محمد فیزی که سالت دارن مریض الحالن و این مجلس از طرف برادر گرامیشون نور چشم ما حاج فیز محمد فیزی و فرزند گرامیشون حاج وحید فیزی که واقعا از خدمتگزارانی به مکتب اهل بیت است خداوند انشاءالله تمامی مریض ها را شفا بدهد شفای آجل انایت بدهد به ویژه حاج گل محمد فیزی را از سای شفای آجل انایت بفرماید سلوات بلندی ختم کنید محضر شما برادران و خواهران عرض کنم که سیره مکتب اهل بیت علیهم صلوات الله و همچنین سیره اسلام این است که احترام اشخاص و افراد باید حفظ شود چه اون شخص پدر انسان باشد چه برادر انسان باشد چه خواهر انسان باشد چه از نزدیکان انسان باشد و حتی یک انسان مؤمن و برادر مؤمن و خواهر مؤمن باشد از سوی اسلام واجب است که احترام اونها حفظ شود و حرمت اونها باید نگه داشته شود وجود نازنین و مقدس امام حسین علیه السلام و السلام برای شخصی که از امام علیه السلام درباره احترام به والدین سوال می کند امام می فرماید های جوان اول احترام پدر و مادرت را رعایت کن بعد می فرماید احترام برادرت را حفظ کن احترام خواهرت را حفظ کن و حتی اون کسانی که از اقربای شماست و از نزدیکان شماست احترام اونها را و تمام معنا حفظ کن گاهن این احترام خدمت شما عرض شود که اگر رعایت نشد حد که حرمت می شود و این حد که حرمت بر دو قسم است یا آبرویی است یا مالی است از جهت مالی خدمت شما عرض شود که همون در ببند از جهت آبروی اگر کسی آبروی یک مؤمن را ببرد یا آبروی یک مؤمن را ببرد حرمت شخص اگر شکسته شود انسان نمی تواند در این عالم او را جبران کند شخصیت مثل پیغمبر خدا آمد کنار مسجد الحرام کنار کعبه استاده شد فرمود ای کعبه اونقدر تو حرمت داری که از سر تا سر عالم مردم می آین دور تو تواف می کنن اونقدر تو حرمت داری کسی نمی تواند در داخل تو در دور بر تو مرچه را بکشد مگسی را بکشد به حیوانات صدمه, و صدمه وارد کند اما بدان ای کعبه با تمام حرمتت با تمام بزرگیت اگر آبروی یک مؤمن برده شود هرز المؤمن کدمه آبروی مؤمن حرمتش بالاتر از کعبه است 
آبروی مؤمن یعنی خون مؤمن اگر کسی آبروی یک مؤمن را ببرد یا مؤمن را ببرد مثل این است که او را به قتل رسانده است بعد امام علیه السلام و سلام می فرماید گاهی این حد که حرمت مالی است گاهی آبرویی است از جهت مالی اگر خدای نکرده انسان در این عالم یک سری افرادی به گردن انسان حق دارد اولین شخصی که به گردن انسان حق دارد پدر و مادر است یعنی ما نمی توانیم خدای نکرده اندکترین بی حرمتی به ساحت مقدسه مادر و پدر کنیم چرا؟ برای این که قرآن دستور می دهد فلا تقل لهما افن به هیچ انوان نمی توانید تو به روی مادرت و پدرت یک اف بگویی یعنی پایین ترین کلمه کوچکترین کلمه که دیگه پیدا نمی شود یک اف نمی توانی نسبت به پدر و مادر بگویی امام حسین علیه السلام و سلام فرمودن شما می دانید که آبروی مؤمن چقدر ارزش دارد امام باقر علیه السلام و سلام این روایت را بیان می کند می فرماید شبی که جدم پیغمبر خدا به معراج دعوت شد وقت خدای باری تعالی عجائب معراج را برای پیغمبر خدا نشان داد بعد فرمود ای پیغمبر یک سری افراد مؤمنن متدینن اینها به من نزدیکن اما ای پیغمبر اسم پیغمبر را می آورد یا رسول الله من اهان لی ولی فقط بارزنی بالمحاربه و انا اسرع شیء الى نصرت اولیائی هر که به دوستی از من اهانت کند هر کی به دوستی از من اهانت کند آشکارا به جنگ من آمده است ولاکن من پروردگار عالم و یاری دوستانم خیلی با سرعت می آیم یعنی اگر کسی بیاید با یک مؤمنی با یک دوست خدا با یک ولی خدا در بیفتد به جنگت اول با خدا جنگیده است و ثانیا خدای باری تعالی از اون ولی خودش حمایت می کند ولی خودش را کمک می کند و جنگ اون کسی که با ولی خدا جنگیده است با سرعت می آید آیان پدر و مادر جایگاه بسیار عظیم نزد پروردگار عالم دارد در قرآن مجید میفرماید و وسین الانسان به والده یعنی ما توصیه کردیم به انسان به والدین تان احسان کنید و وسین الانسان به والده چی احسانا یعنی احسان کنید به پدر و مادرتان ولو کان حیا ولو کان میتا چه پدر و مادر زنده باشد بهش احترام کنید چی از دنیا رفته باشد بهش احترام کنید آیان گاهن حق پدر و مادر آنقدر بالاست که وقتی تو به یک قدرت میرسی ما یحتاج او را تو باید برآورده کنی شخص آمد خدمت پیغمبر خدا یا رسول الله خیلی گرفتارم مشکلات دارم اما پسرم کمک نمی کند پول دارم هست ولیکن مرا یاری نمی کند مرا کمک نمی کند حضرت فرمودن بروید پسر او را بیارید امین که آوردن محضر پیغمبر خدا فرمودن چرا کمک نمی کنی به فرد پدرت ارزداش یا رسول الله ندارم فرمودن تو و مالت تو و مالت 
مال پدرت هستی پدرت هم صاحب توست و هم صاحب مال توست نمی توانی نادیده بگیری جایگاه پدر و مادرت را اولین شاخصه که ما در زندگی باید داشته باشیم لزوم شناخت مادر است ما بفهمیم که مادر چه جایگاهی دارد جایگاه مادر به قدر بالا هست که در روایت هم داریم در قرآن هم داریم که میفرماید حق امک ان تعلم انها حملت که حیث لا يحمل احدا احدا احد احدا خیلی عجیب است این روایت میفرماید حق مادرت میدانی چیز حق مادرت این است که تو و امثال تو نمی توانید جایگاه مادر را درک کنید مادر کسی است که تو را در شکم خودش نگه داشته است از وجود خودش تو را ارتزاق کرده است خودش زیر آفتاب بوده است در ایام گرما تو را در سرما نگه داشته است در ایام سرما تو در گرما نگه داشته خودش در سرما بوده است گاهی مادر گرسنه خوابیده است ولیکن تو باید سیر باشی مادرت بیدار مانده است تو خواب ماندی به خاطر این که به خاطر این که تو اولاد او هستی از اون طرفم این مادر تو را با عشق با محبت بزرگ کرده است حقش این نیست که به او بی احترامی کنی به مادرت بی توجهی کنی خدا رحمت کند گذشتگان ما را بزرگان ما عملشان سیره اونها این بود که هر جایی که می رسید به هر مقام که می رسید جایگاه پدر و مادر را هیچ وقت فراموش نمی کرد مرحوم مغفور آیت الله ازما و شیخ مرتضای انصاری رحمت الله علیه یک سری کارهای انجام داد که خدای باری تعالی او را به مقام رفیع مرجعیت رسان یکی از کارهایش این بود که مرحوم شیخ همیشه در خدمت مادر بود گاهن این مادرش را کول می کرد می آورد دم حمام عمومی تحمیل کیسمال میداد کیسمال وقت مادر را کیسه میکشید نظافت میکرد باز دوباره تحویل میگرفت می آورد کجا منزل خودش بعد میرفت درس اما وقتی که مادرش از دنیا رفت چقدر زیباست جوانها اونهایی که میبینن این برنامه را وقت میرفت به سوی درس میرفت دست مادرش را می بوسید اجازه می گرفت وقت می آمد باز دست مادر را می بوسید اجازه می گرفت که بنشینم اگر مادر اجازه می داد می نشست اگر نمی داد نمی نشست اما این کار باعث شد که مرحوم شیخ به اون مقامات معنوی برسد زمانی هم که از دنیا رفت زار زار گریه می کرد چرا گریه میکنین شما فقی هستید شما بزرگ هستید چرا گریه میکنید فرمودن دیگه آ شیخ مرتضی دعاگو ندارد دیگه آ شیخ مرتضی دست کی را ببوسد به کی تکیه کند مادرم یک تکیگاه بزرگ و عظیمی بود برای من هر زمان که میرفتم به سوی درس میرفتم دست با برکت مادرم را میبوسیدم یک نیرو و یک انرژی و یک حس خوب پیدا می کردم می رفتم به سوی درس وقت می آمدم امینطور این نیرو را خدا برای من داد از کجا به این مقام می رسد؟ از جایی که احترام پدر و مادر رعایت شود این طور نیست که ما فکر می کنیم حساب دو تا چارتا است دو تا چارتا بوده و هست هیچ وقت پنجتا نشده احترام مادر باید سر جای خودش باشد اما حق پدر آیا در حق پدر وقتی میرسیم یک نگاه به زندگی خود ما بکنیم 
هر چه داریم ما از پدر است پدر اصل است ما فر هستیم هر چه نعمت خدا برای من و شما عنایت کرده است از وجود پدر و مادر عنایت کرده است اگر جوانی داری مال پدر است اگر هوشیاری داری مال ماد... پدر و مادر است اگر سرمایه داری مال پدر و مادر است اگر قدرت داری توانایی داری توانمندی داری بازم مال پدر و مادر است هیچ وقت این را به خود راه ندیم این مسئله را که بگوییم نه ما خود ما زحمت کشیدیم ما خود ما هر کاری کردیم خود ما درآمد داشتیم نه اون کسی که تو را بزرگ کرده از کیست اون کسی که تو را خلق کرده خداست فائل اصلی خداست اما وسیله کی بوده پدر و مادر تو به دنیا آمدی بزرگ شدی از نعمت های خدا استفاده می کنی تمام این نعمت ها مال خداست اما وسیله اش پدر و مادر بوده است آقا جان اگر کسی می خواهد در این دنیا به مقامات معنوی برسد دعای پدر و مادر شناخت پدر و مادر انشکرلی و لوالدهی بعد در قرآن می فرماید ولئن شکرتم لعزیدنکم ولئن کفرتم ان عذابی لشدید اگر احترام پدر و مادر را رایت کردی شکر نعمت کردی خدا برایت نعمتت را افزون می کند نعمتت را زیاد می کند اگر بی احترامی کردی به ساحت مقدس مادر مقدس مادر و مقدس پدر بیچاره میشی خیلی کسانی بوده است که در این دنیا احترام پدر را داشته احترام مادر را داشته و مقامات معنوی رسیده است مرحوم مغفور آیت الله ازمای مرعشی رحمت الله علیه می فرماید در نجف اشرف بودم مادر دستور داد که وقت نهار از برو فلانی پدرت را صدا کن آمدم بالا طبقه دوم دیدم که پدرم از شدت خستگی مطالعه خواب رفته است خب چگونه او را بیدار کنم خواب رفته آمدم صورتم را به کف پای پدر گذاشتم آهسته مالیدم دیدم که پدرم از خواب بیدار شد فرمودن شما بدین شمایی ارزه داشتم پدر جان دستور دستور مادر بود باید اطاعت می کردم ناگهان پدر دست بلند کرد به سوی آسمان ارزه داشت خدایا این پسرم را از خادمین اهل بیت علیهم صلوات الله قرار بده آیان با یک احترام شد مرجع بزرگ شیعه شد کسی که چند بار خدمت امام زمان علیه السلام و سلام مشرف شد کارش بجای رسید که خدمت آقا سید و شهدا علیه السلام و سلام رسید از کجا؟ از اون جایی که احترام پدر و مادر را کرد اما بی احترامیش انسان را بیچاره می کند بی احترامی انسان را خار می کند بی احترامی انسان را زلیل می کند این را نگوییم که من برای پدر و مادرم خیلی زحمت کشیدم نه تازه تو وظیفت بوده به وظیفت عمل کردی هزار سالم که تو زحمت بکشی تلاش کنی سعی کنی برای پدر و مادرت یک ساعت از بیدار خوابی ها و درد هایی که هنگام ولادتت میخورد تو نتوانستی جبران کنی پس اگر آمدی احترام به پدر و مادر کردی مورد دعای امام زمان علیه السلام و سلام قرار میگیری یک کسی از نواب عام امام زمان علیه السلام و سلام بود 
در آزربایجان زندگی میکرد این بنده خدا نابینا شده بود پسرش هم خدمت شما هست به یک مقدار لاوالی بود بعد یک روز این پدر در حق اولاد خدمت شما عرض شود که دعای می کند پی که امام علیه السلام و سلام رسید فلانی تو بناس از دنیا بروی اما دعای شما در حق فرزندت قبول شد از این روز و بعد پسرت دیگه دنبال کار خلاف نمی رود و نخواهد رفت و او نماینده من امام زمان علیه و سلام در این شهر خواهد بود آیان این دعای پدر و مادر کار انسان را از این رو به او رو می کند انسان فرشی را عرشی می سازد نفرین مادر هم انسان عرشی را به فرش می آرد. یعنی تعبیر فارسی روان کنم کسی که مورد دعای پدر و مادر قرار بگیرد از زمین به آسمان می رسد اونه که نفرین می شود در حقش از آسمان به زمین می خورد چرا نفرین پدر و مادر انسان را بیچاره می کند پس آیان یکی از عواملی که انسان باید داشته باشد لزوم شناخت پدر و مادر باید باشد پدر و مادر من را تا می توانیم نسبت به ایشان حرمت نگه داریم احترام کنیم احترام پدر و مادر طبق آیه قرآن طبق حدیث نبوی احترام پدر و مادر واجب است شخص آمد خدمت امام باقر علیه السلام یبن رسول الله مادرم مسیحی است امام یک نگاهی کرد فرمودن گوشت خوب میخورند <تصفح> گفت نه شراب میخورند نه فرمودن احترامش بر تو واجب است هر کاری که میتوانی براش انجام بده امین که این شخص برگشت در کوفه تا توانست احترام مادر را انجام داد ناگهان صدا زد پسرم از روزی که به دین جدید گرویدی روش و منشت عین انبیای الهی شده از کجا این کار را یاد گرفتی صدا زد مادر من از اولاد پیغمبر یاد گرفتم پیغمبر ما از دنیا رفته است ولیکن اوسیای پیغمبر جانشینان پیغمبر زنده است یکی از فرزندان پیغمبر امام صادق علیه السلام و سلام است یکی از فرزندان پیغمبر خدا امام باقر است برای من نصیحتی کرده است که حرمت تو را نگه دارم صدا زد پسرم یک تقاضا دارم تقاضا چیه؟ صدا زد مرا به اون دین دعوت کن شهادت این را بر من جاری کن امین که گفت اشهد الله اله الا الله و اشهد ان محمد رسول الله فردای اون روز این خانم از دنیا رفت آجان یک برخورده مثبت کارش به جای می رسد که این بنده خدا مسلمان می شود 24 ساعت هم زنده نمی ماند و مسلمان از دنیا می رود چرا؟ چون برخورد برخورد درسته بود روش روش درسته بود مسیر درست را انتخاب کرده بود مربی خوبه داشت مرشد خوبه داشت معلم خوبه داشت اون باعث شد که این فرد باید مسلمان از دنیا برود پروردگاه را به حق بیبی دعالم ما را نسبت به پدر و مادر و جایگاه پدر و مادر و لزوم شناخت پدر و مادر بیشتر ما را آشنا بگردان خدا یا والدین ما را در پناه اسمت امام زمان حفظ بفرما خدا یا ولی نعمت ما را از ما راضی بفرما خدا یا روح مقدسه حضرت زهرا سلام الله علیه ها را از ما شاد و خورم بفرما خدا یا مریض ها را از سای شفای آجل انایت بفرما 
مریض معلوم از سای شفای آجل انایت بفرما خدایا تمامی مریض ها را از سای شفای آجل انایت بفرما خدایا روح مقدسه حضرت زهرا سلام الله علیه ها از همه ما شاد و خوردن بفرما خدایا این مجلسی که برادر عزیزم آج وحید فیزی گرفته از خدایا از خودش و خانواده اش و تمامی دوستان و عزیزانی که در این شب ها مجلس گرفتن کمک کردن حضورشان با حضورشان مجلس را منور کردن کمک مالی کردن خدایا خودشان و خانوادهشان را از جمعی بلاها حفظ بفرما فراشان خادمین امام حسین علیه صلوات الله را از جمعی بلاها حفظ بفرما خواهران ما که فراشی کردن برادران ما فراشی کردن در این شرایط خدایا خودشان و خانوادهشان را از جمعی بلاها حفظ بفرما اللهم افتح لنا بالخیر واختم لنا بالخیر وجن عواقب امورنا خیرا بر محمد و آل بیت محمد صلوات الله و صلی الله و محمد و آل محمد جهت شفای تمامی مریض ها خصوصا جناب آجگل محمد فیزی همه ما یک حمد شفا همه با هم قرارت کنیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحیم مالکی یوم الدین یا کنه حمد و یا کنه سمیه